This episode sponsored by Great Courses Plus. Hello and welcome history buffs. My name is Nick Hodges and to celebrate our 30th episode, I'm going to do a western and it's going to be one of the greatest of all, Tombstone. This is the story of Wyatt Earp, the heroic US Marshal who brought civilization to a lawless town at the barrel of a gun. Well, at least that's how the legend goes. Since the early days of cinema, there's been a dozen movies made about him, but the vast majority of them are highly romanticized, reshaping historic events to simple themes of good versus evil. Whereas the real story is far more interesting and complex, and I'm happy to say that Tombstone for the most part gets it right. So over the course of this review, I'm going to go into the history behind Wyatt Earp and discuss just how faithful this movie is. This is Tombstone. The town of Tombstone was founded in 1879, and it got its colourful name thanks to the efforts of a prospector called Ed Sheeflin. He would regularly explore the Arizona deserts looking for silver, but was warned against it by the army. They told Sheeflin that the only thing he would find out there was his tombstone. At the time, the Southern Arizona Territory was fraught with danger, home to outlaws, bandits, and hostile Apache. But as luck would have it, Sheeflin did discover silver at a remote site in 1877. A lot of it. So, with a healthy sense of humour, he named his claim Tombstone. News of the silver strike spread like wildfire. Hundreds of people migrated to this remote corner of the Arizona desert to seek their fortune. One of them was Wyatt Earp. Mr. Earp, my name's Dake, Crowley Dake, U.S. Marshal for this territory. Forget it, I'm retired. Excuse me? I said forget it. I don't want the job and that's final. I don't think you understand. Oh, you don't understand, Marshal. I did my duty, and I'd like to get on with my life. This is pretty much all you're going to get as a backstory, just that Wyatt Earp used to be a lawman back in the day. But that wasn't always so. Before his brief career in law enforcement, he was a buffalo hunter, a saloon keeper, a gambler, an enforcer. He even found work as a pimp, which is actually where he met his wife, Matty Blaylock, who was his working prostitute. So, uh, yeah, this extensive resume just shows how Wyatt Earp was more than just a cop. He was a man of his time, a wanderer who roamed across the West to make a name for himself. And it would be in Tombstone where he finally would. Way out West there was this fella, fella I want to tell you about. He called himself the Dude. Now, Dude, that's a name no one would self-apply where I come from. But then there was a lot about the Dude that didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. In the film, we see Wyatt meeting with his brothers, Virgil Earp and Morgan Earp, as well as all of their wives. However, there were two other brothers who also joined them, called James Earp and Warren Earp, but we never see them in the movie. In any case, by the time they're all together in Tombstone in December 1879, the Earp brothers set out to start a stagecoach business by converting the wagons they brought with them. But without any connections or serious capital, they couldn't compete with the larger companies who had gotten there first. So they were forced to sell out, and Wyatt had to look for other ways to make a living. The movie understandably shows none of this due to time constraints. Instead, we skip ahead to Wyatt's reverting back to his old profession as an enforcer. There's this one cool scene that I'm happy to say is pretty accurate. It's when Wyatt pops into the Oriental Saloon, and he spots a gambler making trouble. This shady guy was called Johnny Tyler, and he was the ringleader of a gambling gang called the Slopers. They had their eyes set in the Oriental, but Wyatt was having none of it. He grabbed Tyler by the ear and threw him out onto the street. The only difference is that this altercation took place in 1881 and not 1879, but I was still impressed that something this ambiguous turned out to be true. So after that scene, we see Wyatt reunite with an old friend and everybody's favorite character, Doc Holliday an educated gentleman from Georgia who's remembered as a famous gunslinger, despite the fact that he only ever killed two people. Having said that, he was definitely feared. He had contracted tuberculosis when he was 15, and ever since then, he lived every day as if it was his last, by heavily drinking, getting into bar fights, and gambling with dangerous men, often winning by using his intelligence to piss off poker players. Maybe poker's just not your game, Mike. I know. 
Let's have a spelling contest. How about if I just ring your scurry down? So you might be wondering why a wild card like Doc Holliday was even friends with Wyatt Earp. Well, back in 1878, Doc Holliday saved Wyatt's life in Dodge City, Kansas, and they had remained close ever since. In fact, the reason why Holliday was even in Tombstone was because Wyatt had invited him, and now he was looking to use his gambling skills to make a quick buck. But eventually, he would start provoking the wrong people. Which brings me to one of my favorite scenes in the entire movie, Holliday's confrontation with Johnny Ringo. No. I'm sure of it. I hate him. He's drunk. And we know very fast. I Jake Wurajis. Creda Judea Sotella non ego. Eventus Stultorum. Magister. In pace requiescata. Did they just have a Latin schoolboy off? That is both incredibly geeky and yet cool at the same time. But highly unlikely, I'm afraid. Whilst the real Doc Holliday was educated, Johnny Ringo dropped out of school when he was 14 and didn't speak Latin, which is a shame because this scene is pretty cool. Anyway, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Just who exactly was Johnny Ringo? Well, he was a member of a group of outlaws who were known as the Cochise County Cowboys, criminals who made the bulk of their money by stealing horses and cattle. Some historians claim that these guys were one of the earliest examples of organized crime in America. Initially, they were accepted, or at least tolerated, in the Arizona Territory, simply because they did all of the cattle rustling in Mexico and sold their stolen cattle to corrupt American ranchers. And typical of human nature, it was just someone else's problem. But that tune quickly changed when the Mexican army began building forts along the border, making future crossings difficult. With that no longer an option, the cowboys began carrying out their criminal activity in the Arizona Territory. But unlike in the movie, they're a little bit subtler about it. I mean, for example, one thing they definitely didn't do was brazenly advertise who they were by wearing red sashes. Since Tombstone was released in 1993, it may have been influenced by all those street gang movies coming out at the time. And they might have inspired Tombstone by having the cowboys borrow the gang colors of the Bloods. Color, 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 color. I am a nightmare walking, psychopath talking. King of my jungle, just a gangster, stalking, living life like a firecracker, quick as my fuse. Been dead as a death, back the colors I choose. And then there's this stupid bit where the cowboys are at the theater, and just look at how they give a standing ovation. That's great. It's hilarious how nobody in the audience batters an eye. Like, they see this kind of stuff so often that they're not even phased by it. Which is interesting because this scene inadvertently contradicts another that really happened. On October 28, 1880, a cowboy called Curly Bill Brocious stumbled onto the streets in the dead of night. In the movie, he is high from opium, but from what I was able to research, he may have only been drunk. In any case, it doesn't matter. Whether high or intoxicated, he frightened the townsfolk by firing his gun into the air. The Deputy Marshal Fred White took responsibility and went outside to disarm Curly Bill. Despite knowing Curly's reputation, it still wasn't enough to stop Fred White confronting him. So this begs the question. This isn't cool, but this is cool. You can't shoot your guns into the air outside, but it's perfectly fine indoors. Okay, no doubt some of you are in the comment section saying, No, Nick, they're not scared he's firing his gun into the air. They're worried he might kill someone. Yes, that is true. But then again, how come nobody was bothered by this? Ladies and gentlemen, St. Christmas Day speech from Henry V. Set the scene. God damn, Barnes! Not only does nobody care, but if you slow down the footage, you can clearly see Fred White look like he's about to doze off. Fred, wake up, mate! Billy Zane nearly got shot in the face, don't you care? Look, I I'm sorry I keep bringing up the theatre bit, but I just need to point out how something like this would not be tolerated in Tombstone. That's why it was such a big deal when Curly Bill had his drunken rampage, and especially with what happened next. As Fred White began disarming Curly Bill, the gun misfired, mortally wounding him. Immediately, Wyatt Earp leapt onto the scene and pistol whipped Curly Bill to the ground. As Wyatt began to arrest him, a few cowboys rushed over to confront him, demanding that Curly be released or else. Defiantly, he ignored them, and also the angry townsfolk who wanted a lynching for what happened. Instead, Curly Bill was taken to Tucson to stand trial, but was later acquitted as an accidental shooting. Now, one thing I would like to mention is that by this point in the movie, Wyatt and his brothers are private citizens, and it's the shooting of Fred White that helps convince them later to rejoin law enforcement. In real life, however, Virgil and Wyatt had already done so. 
Virgil became Deputy Marshal of Pima County on November 27, 1879, and Wides became Deputy Sheriff on July 28, 1880. Only Morgan became a lawman after Fred White's death. In fact, the death of Fred White didn't even bring about the ban of guns and tombstone. That wouldn't happen until April 1881, which was about six months later. The reason for them rejoining law enforcement had nothing to do with morality. It was simply to make money. Their original plan for making it rich didn't pan out, so they had to settle for this instead. But there were opportunities to make money as a lawman. In February 1881, Wyatt ran for the office of Cochise County Sheriff, and his biggest perk was keeping 10% of the taxes collected from silver miners, which could earn you up to $30,000 to $40,000 a year, which is about $1 million in today's money. In the run-up to the election, Wyatt and his competitor Johnny Bean made a deal, that if Wyatt dropped out of the race, then Johnny would sign him up as an undersheriff, and they would split the income 50-50. This was of course a lie, and Wyatt was determined in winning the next election. An opportunity to redeem Wyatt came on the 15th of March 1881, when a Wells Fargo stagecoach was transporting $26,000 in silver bullion through the Arizona desert. At around 10 o'clock, three cowboys appeared from the brush to hold up the stagecoach. When it refused to stop, the cowboys opened fire, but despite killing the driver and a passenger, the shotgun driver was able to escape with the silver. Following the botched robbery, the three cowboys went on the run, with a $3,600 bounty on their heads. They were later identified as Bill Leonard, James Crane, and Harry Head. Hearing the news, Wyatt saw an opportunity. If he brought in the cowboys in himself, it could improve his chances of winning the next election for sheriff. In an effort to find them, Wyatt approached a man called Ike Clanton. In the movie, Ike is a full-on member of the cowboys, but in reality, he was more of an associate a rancher who was comfortable in buying their stolen cattle and maintained a close relationship with them. Wyatt proposed to Ike that if he gave up information on the three cowboys' whereabouts, then he could keep the reward money and Wyatt would get the credit. At first, Ike was hesitant, yet the cowboys ever found out that he was as good as dead. So Wyatt gave his words that no one would ever find out, but in the end, it didn't matter. The three cowboys were killed elsewhere, along with any chance for glory or reward. To Wyatt, that settled the matter, but not to Ike. The secret of his betrayal was still very much alive, and it haunted him, fearful of the day if Wyatt ever talked. This was the real reason for the confrontation between Wyatt Earp and Ike Clanton, but it's never shown in the movie. For months, the fear and paranoia consumed Ike, turning him to drink and clouding his judgement. At first, he accused Wyatt of telling his secret to his brothers or his friends like Doc Holliday, and then things came to a head on October 26th, 1881, when a drunken Ike Clanton began making violent threats, swearing in public that he was going to gun down the Earps. There was also a rumour that Ike had recently been to the telegraph office, possibly calling other cowboys for backup. The only thing that was confirmed was that Ike and four other cowboys had been seen in a vacant lot behind the OK Corral. With Ike was his brother Billy Clanton, Billy Claiborne, and Tom and Frank McClary. Wyatt, Virgil, and Morgan debated over what to do next. This personal dispute was dangerously close to escalating, but they couldn't ignore this threat in their lives. And if Ike and his friends were armed, which was illegal in Tombstone, then that alone called for action. During the discussion, Doc Holliday approached the Earps and offered his support. To this, Wyatt said to Doc, It's not your problem, Doc. You don't have to mix up in this. That is a hell of a thing for you to say to me. So just like that, Doc was temporarily deputised, and the four of them headed for the OK Corral, not knowing that they would soon be a part of the most famous gunfight in the history of the Wild West. I would just like to say thanks to our sponsor for this video, Great Courses Plus. If you're interested to learn more about the Wild West, then you should check out their series, The American West, History, Myth and Legacy, with Professor Patrick Allett. From beginning to end, he tells it all in a series of 24 lectures. This subscription on-demand video learning service provides exclusive lectures and courses from top professors of the Ivy League and other great universities globally. It also boasts experts from places like the National Geographic, the Smithsonian, and the Culinary Institute of America. With unlimited access to over 8,000 lectures, you'll be able to learn on any device of your own choosing. To start your one-month free trial, just enter thegreatcoursesplus.com forward slash history buffs, or click on the link in the description box below.
An important thing to know about Tombstone is that, despite its authenticity, it still has a feel of a typical western, one that plays up to the mythology of good versus evil. In the movie, the cowboys are depicted as a menace, and they terrorise the entire town. But as always, the truth is a little bit more complicated than that. The aftermath of the gunfight didn't unite the people of Tombstone, it divided them, with some seeing the Earps as heroes, and others as cold-blooded killers. And the reason why might actually surprise you. A lot of it was simply down to politics. The rural farmers, ranchers, and cowboys were Democrats, who deeply resented the influx of Republican merchants, miners, and corporate businessmen moving into Tombstone. Republican ethics were set on civilizing the West, imposing law and order to safe harbor profitable businesses. The Earp served as guardians for these ethics, earning Republican support. The Democrats, on the other hand, viewed them as government lackeys, only serving in the interest of corporate America at their expense. The extent of this division really shows when comparing Tombstone's two local newspapers' coverage of the gunfight, the Republican Tombstone Epitaph, and the Democratic Tombstone Daily Nugget. The feeling among the best class of our citizens is that the marshal was entirely justified in his efforts to disarm these men, and that being fired upon, they had to defend themselves, which they did most bravely. The funeral of the McLowry brothers in Clanton yesterday was numerically one of the largest ever witnessed in Tombstone. It was a most impressive and saddening sight and such a one as it is to be hoped may never occur again in this community. A few days after the shootout, the Earps and Doc Holliday were arrested and put on trial for the murders of Billy Clanton, Tom McClary, and Frank McClary. The historical accounts for what exactly happened is a little messy. I Clanton accused the Earps and Doc Holliday of attacking his group unprovoked, and they weren't interested in disarming them that he and his party had no intentions of attacking the Earps, and they were simply minding their own business. Sheriff Bean supported this claim by testifying that he told the approaching Earps that he was in the middle of disarming the cowboys, but was ignored. The Earps claimed that what Sheriff Bean really said was that he had disarmed the cowboys, and there was no need to confront them. Whatever Bean may have said, the Earps continued their approach all the same, which does raise a few questions as to their intentions, enough to make even the actors in the film question the motives of our protagonists. It is factual that Sheriff Bean said, you don't have to go down there. The okay, girl, I've disarmed them. Well, if they were going down there to disarm them, and he said that, why did they continue? The Earps and Doc Holliday came down there with shotguns, and uh, their six guns were loaded to the hill. Mm -hmm. They were looking for a fight, and they picked on uh, four of our guys. Two of them had weapons, and the other two didn't. So uh, it was really an unfair fight from the beginning. That's another thing to consider with the Cowboys. If they were preparing to kill the Earps, then why were only two of them armed? And why had they been taken so easily by surprise? They're here to disarm you. Throw up your hands. Oh, not what I want. The prosecution argued that the Earps and Holiday were looking to commit murder, but one moment in the gunfight exonerated Wyatt. When the bullets began flying, an unarmed Ike Clanton threw up his hands and ran to Wyatt. Please, don't shoot me, I got no gun! Fight commence, get the fight or get away! Here was the guy responsible for everything, the man who threatened their lives. But instead of shooting him, Wyatt reacts to his surrender and allows Ike to run to safety. Exactly how you see here. The only thing that didn't happen was Ike running to a nearby shop to continue shooting at the Earths through a window. In any case, Wyatt's composure and professional conduct was enough to convince the court that he and the others acted out of self-defense, and so were found not guilty. This cause for celebration would not be enjoyed for long. The gunfight hadn't resolved anything. Ike and the Cowboys had been humiliated, but they weren't finished. It would be another two months before the Cowboys made their move. On December 28, 1881, close to midnight, Virgil was walking home when he was ambushed by three cowboys armed with shotguns. Miraculously, he survived, but would lose the use of his left arm. Now, Virgil's assassination attempt did happen in the way shown in the movie, but the following scene where the cowboys attack the Earps' wives is completely made up. And in the interest of time, the movie condenses another historic event to occur on the same night as Virgil's shooting. On March 18th, 1882, Morgan Earp was playing billiards when two bullets were fired through a window, one striking him in the back. Mortally wounded, Morgan bled to death in Wyatt's arms. These shootings would have a profound effect on Wyatt and his attitude towards the law. 
When Virgil had been shot a few months earlier, I Clanton was arrested when his hat was discovered at the crime scene, but the case was dismissed when the other cowboys provided alibis. In private, the judge told Wyatt, You'll never clean up this crowd this way. Next time, you better leave your prisoners out in the brush, where alibis don't count. And now that Morgan was dead, these words were etched in Wyatt's mind. He had followed the rule of the law to the letter, but it still wasn't enough to bring the cowboys to justice. So instead, he would serve his own brand of justice, outside of the law. But before he could do that, he needed to get his brother Virgil out of Tombstone. As the train was getting ready to leave, Wyatt spotted two cowboys preparing an ambush. It was Frank Stilwell and Ike Clanton. Now the movie plays out the death of Frank Stilwell a little differently. For some reason, Wyatt lets Ike Clanton live to let the other cowboys know he's coming for them. But what really happened was that Frank Stilwell tripped and Clanton ditched him. When Stilwell got up, Wyatt had him at his mercy. And Frank put up his hands in surrender. Okay, lawman. Let's go to court. No. The murder of Frank Stilwell was taken more seriously than we see in the movie. For shooting an unarmed man in cold blood, an arrest warrant was issued for Wyatt. Sheriff Bean tried to serve it, but Wyatt was having none of it. From now on, he was going to embody the role of judge, jury, and executioner. Taking Doc Holliday and a few others, they went on a killing spree, trying to gun down as many cowboys as they could find. At least, that's what we see in the movie. In real life, they only killed four people. The most notable was on March 24th, 1882, when the Earp Party tracked down Curly Bill Brocious and some other cowboys by a spring. And my fellow history buffs, what follows is probably one of the funniest scenes in cinematic history. No. 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 Son of a bitch. No! <laughs> okay, um, in all seriousness, if you ignore the bad writing and the cheesy acting for this one scene, it's surprisingly close to what actually happened. Disregarding his own safety, Wyatt approached the cowboys alone. Bullets were whizzing all around, but not a single one hit him. Using a shotgun, he blasted Curly Bill to pieces before making his miraculous escape. Historically, this event would mark the end of what the newspapers had dubbed the Tombstone Vendetta. But the movie takes it a little bit further by having Johnny Ringo leading the rest of the cowboys after the Earps. Ringo and Ben are out front. There is about 30 of them. They're all wearing badges. The deputizing of the cowboys is absolutely true. Sheriff Bean was a Democrat and a known associate of theirs, so his involvement complicated things. It blurred the legal confines of the law by pitting one group of lawmen against another. The reason why was because Sheriff Bean still wanted to bring Wyatt in for the murder of Frank Stilwell and more. Fortunately, this epic clash between the two groups never happened, but not for the reason the movie is saying. In Tombstone's finale, Johnny Ringo challenges Wyatt to a duel to settle everything once and for all. The tension builds as we are often reminded of Ringo's superior skills as a gunfighter compared to Wyatt, even though the real Ringo wasn't anything special. I didn't think you had it in you. I'm your huckleberry. But surprise, it's Doc Holliday who takes Wyatt's place, and despite a tense standoff, he effortlessly guns down Ringo, a fitting arc to such a beloved character. But in real life, this epic duel probably didn't happen. The death of Johnny Ringo is shrouded in mystery. All we know for sure is that Johnny Ringo was found dead lying against a tree with a bullet hole in his right temple. Officially, this death was marked as a suicide, but many historians to this day remain unconvinced. It doesn't seem likely that Doc Holliday or the Earps were responsible, as Ringo's corpse was found on July 14, 1882. By that point, the Earp Party had disbanded and left the Arizona Territory in order to escape their outstanding warrants. But thanks to Wyatt's supporters, they would never be served. They didn't even get their hands on Ike Clanton in the end. He was shot and killed in 1887 by a lawman in different circumstances. The film ultimately concludes with an emotional goodbye between Wyatt and Doc Holliday, who is finally on his deathbed. Thanks for always being there, Doc. It's a beautiful scene, but sadly this never happened. Shortly after the Earth Party disbanded, Wyatt and Doc had a serious falling out. The details aren't fully known, but there is one possibility that it may have been over a woman. 
Josephine Marcus, an attractive Jewish lady who caught Wyatt's eye back in Tombstone, and allegedly Doc called Wyatt a damn Jew boy, which angered Wyatt, causing their friendship to end. Wyatt had fallen in love with Josephine and later married her. So Doc and Wyatt were never the same after that, and they split ways. For a brief moment, their paths crossed once more in 1886, but in the end, Doc died alone in the Hotel Glenwood in 1887. As for Wyatt, he lived on to see the 20th century, before settling down in Los Angeles, California. He died in 1929. His legacy as a gunslinger was born just a few years after, from a biography published in 1931 called Wyatt Earp, Frontier Marshal. It told the story of a righteous hero who saved a lawless town from the evilest of criminals. It was a colourful exaggeration of the truth, but it nevertheless created a legend, and forever romanticised the West. Today we have a better understanding for what really happened, but it still continues to divide people about Wyatt Earp. Some seeing him as a reluctant hero who was pushed to the extremes by a broken system, and forced to take justice with his own hands. Others seeing him as a criminal vigilante who decided he was above the law. Both views are ultimately correct, so it really falls down to how you perceive him. Tombstone takes on the more romantic approach with Wyatt Earp, but there are still some dark moments with this character which I'm thankful for. Overall, I'd say this is an awesome movie, and I can't recommend it enough. In spite of its cheesy moments here and there, it does a remarkable job of faithfully adapting history, and whatever minor inaccuracies I could find, they weren't enough to spoil my enjoyment. Well that about wraps it up, my name is Nick Hodges, and thanks for joining me for 30 episodes! I can't wait to do more! Until next time, have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year! Remember to support History Buffs on Patreon if you wish to do so. And as always, let me know in the comment section what you thought about Tombstone. And of course, what historical movie should I review next? In the meantime, check out the History Buffs Twitter and Facebook page for new updates. See you in 2018.